Welcome everyone to Women's Speakers Association Premier Member Spotlight Speaker Success TV Show. Wow, try to say that <laughs> all at once. Again, Speaker Success TV, and it is all about our talented, brilliant community. And this is where we highlight our best and our brightest. We call them our premier members. If you're not a premier member, you're missing out. This is what we're talking about, and this is what makes us strong. So who am I talking about? Who is us? Well, Women's Speakers Association, and I'm kind of going out of order with my introduction, so that's what I, that's what I get. So before we get into sales strategies and best practices, I want to make sure everyone that's on here goes to joinwsa.com and engage and get ready to feel like you are part of a wonderful and supportive family that gets you. You're you get great resources for this year and beyond. You get to hear from your fellow members like Wendy Y. Bailey. You're hanging out, masterminding with influential women that are changing the world just like you. All right? Now, something else, and I, I put it here so you can know about who we are at Women's Speakers Association. We are the go-to place for innovative leaders, change agents, and women with the message to connect collaborate and grow their visibility worldwide in order to fulfill their mission. A world in which women take ownership of and step into being the leaders that they are, using their voice to powerfully inspire others, thus causing transformation in the lives of their clients, their companies, communities, and the world. Now, my name is Marquesa Petway. I'm out here in New York City, your Speaker Success TV premier spotlight broadcasting host. I'm a business reinvention expert. I'm also a speaker magazine columnist, and I help entrepreneurs create six-figure signature systems. And if you want to follow me, my handle is speaker talk, and I can also be found at gotta-speak-now.com. So today, oh my gosh, we have a full house. So many people registered for this. I've been doing this for a while, and this is one of our highest levels of registration, and you will not be disappointed because this woman is fierce. So let me tell you why. All right. Her name, let me introduce you to Wendy Y. Bailey, our premier member being spotlighted on WSA Speaker Success TV show, a force of nature and trendsetter in the coaching industry because of her fearless approach, I can't even say the words right, fearless approach to innovation. Wendy Y. Bailey has been supporting entrepreneur leaders, coaches, speakers, trainers, and consultants for more than 14 years, a mentor, coach, and sales speaker for her fierce and dynamic dedication to inspiring individuals, groups, organizations to create extraordinary results. Now, Wendy Y. has spoken internationally and coached many across the U.S. and in countries like UK and Italy. She is the chief visionary of Beyond of the Beyond Limits Life Movement, a group focused on moving its members to abundance via their mindset, marketing, and sales mastery. Wendy Y. has been a featured expert in Black Enterprise and on various other radio shows uh, and media outlets. And Black Enterprise, by the way, is a magazine. She coaches her clients on income acceleration, revenue generation, and client infusion, leading to significant financial outcomes while creating lasting personal and professional success. Bailey has trained professionally at Coach U, Coach Training Alliance, Coach Veal, and the Fearless Living Institute. She holds a degree in management from National Louise, Louise, and I may be pronouncing that wrong, University, as well as a number of coaching designations, including Master Business Coach, Certified Neuro Logistic Program, that's NLP, Practitioner, and a Certified Experience Coach. So she knows coaching. Please join me in welcoming your Income Acceleration Mentor, Wendy Y. Bailey. Yay! <laughs> hello, hello. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Marquesa. I appreciate it. You're welcome. And then, by the way, Wendy Y., why do we call you Wendy Y.? Well, it's, it's a long story, but I'll give you the short version of it. I've been coaching and in my business for more than 14 years. And most of the time, I've had a website. But that did not necessarily mean I marketed or I, I practiced on selling online. So in 2008, when I decided I was going to be an active online marketer, 
And I came to the marketplace that was around the time that Facebook was taking off and LinkedIn was taking off and social media was really becoming very prominent in your online marketing, you know, tactics and strategies. And when I looked on LinkedIn, there were 25 profiles for Wendy Bailey. So I had to set myself apart and I started using my Y, which is the first letter of my middle name. And it came out very naturally because before that, I was doing uh, some offline networking and I always introduced myself as Wendy Y. Bailey. So people started calling me Wendy Y, Wendy Y, because I always said I'm Wendy Y. Bailey. <laughs> and it just kind of caught on. It's caught on so much so now, Marquesa, that even family members call me Wendy Y. So you're great at branding yourself. I love it. And you know what? You stand out from all the other Wendy's. So I love that. Really. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, no. Wendy what? Guys. Huh? Let, let me just add this. I looked recently to see how many profiles for Wendy Bailey there are now on LinkedIn. 250 plus. Just for Wendy Bailey. Not Wendy some other last name, but Wendy Bailey, just like mine. So if you Google me, Wendy Y. Bailey, you'll always find me. But if you Google Wendy Bailey, you'll find the musician, you'll find the psychologist, you'll find the athlete. There are a ton of Wendy Baileys out there, believe it or not. Wow. Brilliant. I love that. So I guess I shouldn't complain that my name is Marquesa. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. You, you're a unique girl. <laughs> Embrace it. Love it. Bathe in it. All right. Well, let's get ready to talk because they're dying to hear your advice. So my first question coming at you is, Wendy, why is sell such a dirty word to many entrepreneurs? I, you know, I think historically when people think of, of sales and selling, they sort of envision this plaid clad used car salesman or saleswoman coming up to them, sort of trying to strike a deal or maneuver or manipulate them into buying a car. And because of that, that bad image, when it comes to selling, we think we're supposed to step into some maneuver or some manipulation or some tactic to get clients to buy from us. And it really isn't a bad word when you understand what selling really is. Selling is merely an invitation for your clients to do business with you. Do business with you means enrolling your program. Do business with you means you know, buy your product. Do business with you means hire you for consulting. Do business with you means hire you to speak more. Do business with you means hire you to train. Whatever do business with you means, it's about an invitation. So when you understand it's an invitation and there's a particular way to language your invitation, selling isn't bad. Selling is just really an extension of service that you provide to your client. Now, Wendy, would you say for some speakers that don't get that, and maybe for whatever reason, it could be money, it's so many different reasons where sales is still a dirty word, do you think that that impacts their success when it comes to selling, no matter which platform? Without question, without question. How you show up, and I call that intention, how you show up an in intention in the sales conversation, and make no mistake, if you are speaking from the stage, if you're on a webinar, if you're on a teleseminar, a telesummit, if you're speaking to the media, you are in a sales conversation. You're always in the mode of selling when you're doing it right, because you always want to leave people, your potential clients, wanting more from you wanting to learn how they can work with you. So they're ready for your invitation. Guys, did you hear this? She is dropping bullets. Make sure, Tracy, please put our uh, uh, our handle in there and put Wendy's handle. Wendy, please put your handle in there because you guys got to tweet her out. She is dropping it. Okay, so here's another question. What if you master it? What if you never master it? Are you in trouble? Yeah, you are. <laughs> You, you, you totally are. But, but let me just sort of take the, the pressure off by saying mastery is really about being an extension of your authentic self. It's not about learning some new technology. It's not about learning something different than who you are. It's about really kind of finding out how you express the invitation in your own natural way and then building that across platforms. It's just that simple. Now, there are a lot of different industries and entrepreneurs out there that struggle with selling, but why is it that, why do you think speakers struggle with it? 
in particular? Well, because we think as speakers that we're supposed to turn on the sales you know, button when it's time to, to really pitch. I hate the word pitch because I don't believe in it. Mm -hmm. I think from the time you take the stage, you are in a selling conversation. You're yes. in a sales conversation. Your invitation begins the moment you take the stage and open your mouth. Did you guys hear that? The moment. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't happen after you've given all of this delicious content and you have, you know, covered your three points or your five strategies or your seven steps. It happens the minute you open your mouth when you touch the stage. Now, you mentioned sales language is important. What do you mean by that? Well, you, you said in my introduction that I'm an NLP practitioner, and I'm really proud of that accomplishment because when I learned and studied to be certified as an NLP practitioner, it was like learning a whole nother language for me. It was like learning Spanish. It was like learning French, but in a different way. And let me tell you what I mean. Let me give you the, the quick, windy, wide definition of NLP. Neuro Linguistic Programming, or NLP, has three parts. The first part is neuro, the second part is linguistic, and the third part is programming. And again, this is the windy wide definition, so it's really simplified because that's kind of how I embrace NLP, and I you know, made it part of who I am. The neuro piece says that whatever the information is that comes to us, we're always processing it through our five senses. So sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. And touch is internal feelings as well as tactile, okay? So that's the first piece, thinking of the five senses and how we process in information, any kind of information. The second piece is linguistic. When you think of linguistics, you think of language, obviously, right? Most people see language as words. Well, when you're looking at the five senses, it's also colors, Images, smells, sounds, tastes, feelings, beliefs, attitudes, behaviors, all of that goes into language. And when you understand that we are all processing that same information in different ways, you understand that everybody has a particular way that information is coded for them. That's the programming piece of it. And as a coach, when I understand the programming or how that information is coded for people, and I'll get a little bit clearer about this in just a second, when I understand how the information is coded for people, then I can help my clients achieve more faster, okay? Because if you're someone who needs visual cues to learn, then I want to always be painting pictures for you to see in your mind. I want you always to be hearing things if you're an auditory person. I want you always to be feeling emotions if you're a kinesthetic person. Those are NLP terms, but that's what I mean by language. You can't just say any old words. You've got to speak a language and a mix for an audience that covers all of the five senses. I love it. Oh my gosh. You're reminding me years ago, because I was a sales executive uh, many, many years ago, very successful. And uh, we did the whole disc thing. So it almost looks like NLP is in that space where you have to mirror who you're trying to sell to. You got to know what's important to them, what gets their attention. I love it. I've never heard anyone explain it so clearly. You did yeah. that flawless. Did you guys Thank love you. it? Thank um, you. Oh, love it. I told you guys this would be good. Uh, here's a question for you. What are two of the elements you must be present for selling to be successful? Wow. Two really big ones, but really simple ones. Rapport and connection. Rapport and connection. Because here's the thing. You hear everyone say, who's a marketer? Oh, you want people to know like trust. You want people to know like trust. You want people to know like trust. Yeah, that's important. But guess what? If they don't have an experience of you that connects to who they are as a visual learner or an auditory learner or a, a kinesthetic thinker or feeler, if they don't have a connection to you, if they are not in rapport with you around how they see the world, you're missing an opportunity to really con convert them. You can't convert someone that you're out of rapport with. 
you ever saw someone see someone on a stage and you go wow they're really great they're really you know I'm really enjoying what they're saying and then you walk out of the room and someone says wow how was it what did you learn and you go I don't know <laughs> You know, so it, it's, it's more than, than just the feel good. It's about making a, a sincere, bona fide connection and building rapport with who they are. It's the, the adage that says what's in it for them. Whenever you're on a stage, your, your audience is always saying, what's in this for me? What is she saying that really relates to me? Mm -hmm. And rapport is about connection, as I said. Rapport is about compassion is about service. People need to know that you care. Rapport is about sharing. So when you think of sharing, you think of being transparent. You think of really being very intentional about how you share your stories. You think of being very uh, clear about the message you want to send and, and the emotions you want to stir for that kinesthetic person who's listening. You think about the pictures you want to paint for that visual person who's, who's watching. You think about the person who's listening and they want to know that what you're saying has meaning for them. And it has meaning in a way that says, you know what, she gets me. She now, really Wendy, gets me. Are all she really so gets me. You're using all three of those, no matter which audience you're in front of, or you're trying to decide, all right, this is more of a visual audience. This is more of a, an aesthetic audience. Well, I'm going to answer that question in two ways. I think that the reason you always, when you're speaking, whether it's webinars, keynotes, virtual, online, teleseminars, telesummits, you always want to know who your audience is so that you understand what kind of audience you're working with. That's one thing. But the second part is you never always know this is a total, totally visual audience or this is a total, total audio audience, auditory audience, or this, you know, you never know that. So you've always got to be mixing. You've always got to be mixing. It's about painting the pictures. It's about creating the sounds. It's about immer immersing them in the experience of you so that you're building that rapport and connection every single time. Oh, I love that. And then there's another piece to it. You talked about two elements. So rapport and connection is one of the elements. What's that second one? There are a bunch. Okay. <laughs> I'm, telling you, I'm telling you there are two, but there are a bunch. Rapport and connection is one. Listening and focus is another. When you are speaking, whether it's from the stage or on a webinar, an online platform, and again, we're talking across platforms, so I want to make sure I'm clear that wherever you are, these elements that I'm giving you are necessary. Mm -hmm. So the second element is listening and focus listening and focus and when you listen and you focus even when you're doing a, a stage presentation you can listen for what the audience is saying or not saying you can hear the ahas by the gasps that people have when when you say something or by the, by the laughter when they feel something that you said is funny or by the mm, when they really felt whatever you said. So paying attention to that and then really zeroing in on that in a way that you can expand it even more. So it's more than just, I made them laugh and that was exactly what I wanted them to do. Well, in the laughter, what did you make them feel? In the laughter, what did you help them to see? In the laughter, what did they hear that really connects to who they are and the, the issue that they may be bringing to that particular event or the, the pleasure that they want, those bold passion points that you want to express to them as well. I always hear people talk about pain points and, oh, you know, if you're selling, you want to dig into the pain points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you've also got to recognize the pleasure and the pleasure is in the big, bold promises. Whatever your program is, you've got to be selling those big, bold promises throughout. And let me give you just a quick example. Remember I said when you first get on the stage, that's when you start selling? Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you five points. And I have probably about 12 more that I can give you. But today, I'm only going to give you five. Mm -hmm. And you know, I have programs that you can look at that will give you the rest of the, the 12. 
That's the language. That's the seeding that you do when you begin your speech, your presentation. As you go through your presentation, you continue with that by saying, wow, you know, in one of my programs, my clients always come into the program going, I'm going to get A, B, C, and D, whatever A, B, and C, and D are. And they always find that they get so much more than that. And I love that because I'm always over-delivering. Did you hear the big, bold promise mm -hmm. in what I said? That's an example mm -hmm. of the language that you use. You share client success stories. You tell more about the program. You talk about the expectations. You share the big, bold promises. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you get into some of the pain points, but that's really stirring the emotion and the interest in experiencing more of what you offer. And I love it because with the bold promises, with the I help the clients there, now you're making me feel like, oh, maybe I could be one. What if I were one? She'll pull. Because if you stay in the pain, I'm going to stay in the pain. But if you tell me the transformation, right. then I'm more likely to say, Wendy, tell me more. Here's something, a question for you here. Number one, I love that you said listen. Because sometimes the audience's body language is not what you hope it will be. What? So what happens in that case? If they're sitting there going, mm-hmm or maybe they're not tuned in, or maybe it's a mismatch, maybe the meeting planner you know, didn't quite give you the right preparation steps, and it's just not the right time. What's your advice at that point, if, if, the, if the speaker is truly listening to the audience? Well, and you're right. The speaker should always listen, and body language definitely is an indication. If you're seeing the mm and the you know, resistance is a sign that you are not in rapport. So when you're in that space, go back, regroup, and work to get in rapport. So maybe it's touching on something. Maybe you found out that the, the audience has people who have kids, little kids, or, you know, tweens, or teenagers, or adult children, or grandchildren, or whatever it is. Maybe you touch on something that's familiar. Maybe you touch on the fact that they have kids and you share a story about your kids mm -hmm. or you touch on um, something funny that your grandbaby did or something like that. I don't have grandkids, so I don't have those kind of stories, mm -hmm. but I do have stories when my son was a little boy and some of the things that he did that they can connect to. That's why rapport and connection go together because if someone is resistant, they're not in rapport with you. They're looking at you and they don't believe you. They don't recognize any value you're going to give. So until you reestablish rapport or e either establish rapport, you've got to make sure you do that before you can really move forward to sell. Mm -hmm. You've got to. Because if someone is resistant and they're not in rapport, they're not going to buy from you. So true. Not. Now, I know speakers are screaming out because they really want you to answer this. There's an advantage when you're in person and you can read people. You mm -hmm. can see what's going on, but what happens when you're doing a webinar and you can't see your audience? All you see are names in a chat room, if you're lucky. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. what happens in that case? Then where does the listen, the rapport, where does all that come in? Well, I will tell you, like, here I am, I'm watching the chat right now to see, you know, who's saying what and what they're, they're experiencing. I'm getting a sense of where people are by the number of people who are present, mm -hmm. who's talking and who's not, or who's chatting and who's not, what the people are chatting or saying, what the people who aren't chatting aren't saying. So I'm sort of gauging all of that in my head as we go through this particular type of webinar. So you've got to be uh, able to kind of multitask and hear and see what might not be obvious when you're using platforms like webinars and teleseminars. Mm -hmm. When I do group coaching, for example, I really pay attention. And most of the time it's, I've started doing video group coaching now and I'm always in, and I use Zoom as my tool and I'm always in the gallery view because I want to see the people's faces and I want to see their expressions and I want to see them nodding or shaking their heads. And I'm paying attention to all of that. And I'm gauging my language and what I do to get in rapport, what stories I tell, what I share, what I don't share, how I address them about the next point I'm covering. I do all of that. And it's a, it's a way of multitasking based on the platform that you're on. 
when I used to do more uh, teleseminars and group coaching via telephone, sometimes if you're just silent, you can hear the stir of emotion. Mm -hmm. You can hear the person on the other end getting a little emotional or a little choked up because of the breakthrough they're experiencing. But you've got to pay attention to that. You can't just run over it and think, oh, well, you know, they're not saying anything, so that must mean they're okay, or they're not saying anything, so i got to just keep moving. You need to be quiet and let the quiet happen so that you can see what the experience is that they're having. You've got to pay attention. Whatever the platform, you've got to pay attention. Yeah. You, know, you, ever, you ever delivered a, a, a presentation, for example, Marquesa, and you thought you were being funny and no one laughed? <laughs> sure. Or they did, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. This was funny now, so I'll come back on it. But yes, certainly. Yeah. And, and I love that you said, wait a minute. This was funny. Why do you guys laugh? That is so transparent because it's like you're letting them know, hey, I said that and it was supposed to be funny. You didn't laugh. So let's back up and make sure you know I put a pin in it and I thought it was funny and I know I wanted you to. And in my transparency, I'm letting you know it didn't work. So I'm going to keep trying, but I want you to know that one didn't work. There's more funny stuff to come. Because in that transparent moment, people are like, oh, well, that's kind of cute. I, I like that she can laugh at herself. You know, that, that reasonable amount of self-deprecation in that moment is really human. And people love humanity. People love it when you're real about stuff that works and doesn't work in your presentations. And I love that you said uh, funny or when you're telling a joke. Our very own Kim Coles, who's a member of WSA, you know, the actress on um, Living Single, said that very thing. I'll tell a joke sometime when I'm speaking. Don't make the audience feel bad if they don't laugh. But the transparency is important. Now, here's an important question. Telesummits. Now, you know, with telesummits, you're often getting interviewed by an expert. And oftentimes, it's ahead of time. And then they'll show it later, and they'll send it out. Is there some type? And, and hey, oftentimes, your money or your success with that telesummit is usually based on selling. Mm -hmm. So what it, when it because this is so important when it comes to the rapport the connection you also put permission in here and all of that where does that fit in in the telesummit world when you're thinking of a telesummit again you you said it you're typically being interviewed by someone and it's great that you're being interviewed because you get to provide some of the questions that drive the interview that drive the conversation. You're still in a selling conversation, so you've still got to pay attention to how you answer those questions, that mix, that sensory mix, so that you're hitting all kinds of learners, all kinds of listeners and watchers and feelers in what you describe. And the more mix you give with some meat on it, Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what I mean in a second. With some meat on it, the more engaged people will be. Every single time I do a telesummit, I get tons of opt-ins, you know, because usually you offer like a, a free gift or some sort of opt-in. And every single time I do it, I know that I've hit the mark because I get a lot of opt-ins. And I can tell when they're replaying my interview because my opt-ins will go up again. Mm -hmm. When you get that kind of response, you know you have done exactly what you were supposed to do. You created the mix and you gave them some meat. And here's what I mean. It's not just about pain and pleasure. It's not just about hitting the pain points and sharing the big bold promises. You've also got to give people something to hold on to, something that they can apply. Because application is at the heart of everything. What is that expression? Um, I see, I remember, I hear, I forget, I do, I understand. When people get to do something based on something you've shared, even if the, it just stirred them emotionally or they really felt something or they saw something or they heard something that they really connected to, when they get to apply what you told them, all of a sudden it has meaning. It's real in their lives and they want more of you. 
I love that. You just get, I mean, that was a huge golden nugget. Try to put something that they can apply, even if it's simple, right in that presentation. That's why if you're in person, you can do some type of uh, group exercise. Right. Uh, we're getting a lot of comments here. Just want to mention a couple of them. Kristen says, that's for me the biggest difference between a lecture and a speaker, that engagement and understanding of the audience, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and Tracy complimented her on pointing out the difference there. And then here's something that's really important too, because you put that on your list, media. Media, remember media, not, not a bad word, love it, but they have their own agenda and they're very conscientious of an author coming on, trying to you know, pump their book or whatever. What, in that case, what mindset or what, what's your advice if you find yourself in that situation and you want some results post-interview? Well, the big thing about doing media is remembering that you're there to provide a service. And the service is not to the media person who's interviewing you. It's to the audience who's watching you in that interview. Mm -hmm. So your service has to extend to them, not to the interviewer. Okay. So no matter what the interviewer asks you, your response has to be in service to the audience, to the watcher, to the listener of the interview. And, and here's what I mean. It kind of goes back to what I said about the meat and the pain and the pleasure. You still seed, and you know, S-E-E-D is the word I'm using, by saying, well, I'm gonna answer that question with three of the points that I typically give in my 12-week program. Or here, here, are the, here are three of the things that I talk about in my book. You know, you still seed, and then you give the pain, the pleasure, and the meat. Most of the people who read my book, when they look at this point, and I share it with them, this is how they respond to it. And then I give them the second and third, and it just changes their world. So you can imagine when they get all of the points that are in the book, all of a sudden, they're like in a whole different space. Like, I didn't give you a whole lot of detail, but you get the language of seeding in serving the audience for of the interview. Excellent, I love that. And one thing about interviewers, you do kind of have to kiss the butt of the interviewer just a little bit, so yeah, they don't back. Bit. But I love what you said, and be careful about saying your book too much, because they do pick up on that, but I love that, because media is where a lot of folks want to go, and it's a unique situation. Now, permission, Wendy, I really want you to talk about that. That's, I think, one of the elements, and that's, that's something that folks, never quite get sometimes. Can you talk about permission? I can. Um, have you ever been in a conversation and you've been sharing your thoughts about something or, or an area that you had an issue with and you, the person on the other end says, well, let me tell you exactly what you need to do. You need to do A and B and then you need to do C and D. And once you get through that, I'm going to tell you who you need to talk to. And this is, how do you feel when that happens? Like, do you feel overwhelmed? <laughs> exactly. You feel overwhelmed. You feel like, oh my gosh, what did they do? It blows you away in a very offensive and uncomfortable way. So, permission in your sales conversations, and remember, every time you get on the stage, you're in a sales conversation. Every time you step on a webinar, you're in a sales conversation. Permission is saying, these are things that I want to share with you, and I want to make sure you know I'm going to share them. Are you okay with that? Real simple language. Are you okay that I'm going to share this? This is a big deal. This is a lot for you to absorb. Are you okay with me sharing it? Ask for permission. When you're in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, it's easy to say and to see the offense. You know what I mean? Like I've been on both sides of it where someone kind of blew my ears back by telling me more than I wanted to hear or even ask for and I've also done it to people where I halfway through the conversation went, uh-oh, you know, I, I think I should have asked if it was okay with you if I did this or I said this. So I know both sides of it. You've got to stand in awareness when you're speaking from the stage and ask permission. You got, guys, I really want to tell you this story, and it's, it's something that's very near and dear to me, and it, it was a painful time in my life. Is it okay if I share it with you? And the audience is like, yeah, go ahead. And that means if you get to some of those tearful moments in your story where you're talking about the pain, 
they're like cheering you on. It's okay, Wendy, why? Tell us, you know, we're here for you. And so all of a sudden, you've established rapport in a way that you didn't think. Now, I'm not saying manufacture emotion. What I'm saying to you is you've gotten the permission ahead of time so that whenever that happens, whenever anything happens, they're there to support you because you've gotten their buy-in to even share. Oh, I love that. And, you know, just as a footnote to that, um, especially for those that are listening, well, two things, audience members, and I don't know if you agree, to the, agree with this, Wendy, there are some audience members, as soon, as soon as they sense that you're going in that direction where you offer something, they shut down. No matter how much they loved you before, or whatever, some people are just, for whatever reasons, we won't get into that, they shut down. And to your point of permission, to me, that seems to be the perfect place to say, all right, I shared X, Y, and Z, um, you know, you got this and this, blah, blah, blah. Can I, you know, really checking in with the audience and making sure that they felt like they got value? And if they did, now can I go in and share this with you? Mm -hmm. A little bit. I think that's great. And I also think that when you have those people, and you're always going to have them no matter where you're seeking on the platform <laughs> that are going to check out. You know, sometimes they will drop off of your call or sometimes they will, you know, disconnect from your webinar, whatever it is. And I love being able to acknowledge that they've done that. Okay, the people who were not ready for the message I have have already dropped off. And it's okay because I'm here to talk to you. Ah, ah. I'm here to talk to acknowledge you. it. Okay. <laughs> acknowledge it. You know, yeah, some people, I'm not everybody's cup of tea, and it's okay that I'm not everyone's cup of tea. I'm glad that you're st still here with me so that I can tell you a little bit more. Is that okay? Great. Let me tell you. There you go. I you love know? that. Acknowledge it. You know, you don't know. let it be a, a, a visible elephant, but acknowledge it. Yeah, and, and because here's the thing. There are people who are going to say yes. There are people who are going to say no, and there are people who will be undecided, sort of riding the fence. Mm -hmm. The no's are going to be no's are going to be no's, okay? So you don't have to do more than just acknowledge the no's. Mm -hmm. Because what may happen is, because you said, okay, you may be feeling this way, and I'm okay if you feel that way, because again, I'm not everyone's cup of tea. That's the language I like to use. Mm -hmm. I'm not everyone's cup of tea, and it's okay that I'm not, because there are some very specific language and some very specific things I want to talk to the people who are interested in hearing more of what, I've had, what I have to say. Mm -hmm. And the no's may go, did she just tell me that I wasn't her cup of tea and... And, you know, did she just acknowledge me as a no? Let me find out what else she has to say. Let me listen a little bit more closely. And they may end up becoming someone who is a, more of a question mark or even a yes mm -hmm. because they stay to listen after you acknowledge the no. There you go. Oh, I love it. Even Les Brown, you know, the great Les Brown sells. And I remember bringing him into New York and, as I walked out the room, someone said, I had to go because I was upset, you know, because he sold, but I couldn't afford to buy, so I'm pissed off. So sometimes it has nothing to do with you. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes it's where the person is. Now, question here is, will you, fluency, fluency, will you share some examples of what is that? Fluency. Well, if you can imagine going to a foreign country, mm -hmm. and uh, let's just say you go to Mexico, Okay and you are there and everyone around you is speaking Spanish and you don't know the slightest bit of Spanish, what do you do? You, you kind of, you know, go through your Rosetta Stone book while you're there and try to figure out what's being said around you or, or you try to learn enough so that you have some level of fluency before you go, right? So fluency when it comes to this language that I'm talking about is the more you do it, the better you get at it. Okay. It's like anything. And here's, here's an example of me using the language. You've got to bathe in the mix, the sensory mix. You've got to create that sensory mix in your stories, in your metaphors, in your exercises, in your examples, in everything that you do. You've got to bathe in it. Put it on like it's a new outfit and wear it regularly all the time so that it gets tattered and torn and you're used to wearing it 
and it's not something so new and different. And you only get that way by doing it, by wearing it, by using it. That's when the fluency happens. Oh, I love that. And then let's say that you do get really strong with fluency. I mean, and your sales numbers are through the roof and you're doing it. What happens? Uh, and I don't know if you address this when, um, you know, sometimes you'll sell something and folks don't apply. So they're like, oh, shit, you sell, sell, sell. And then sales again becomes that bad word a little bit because you're so good at it and then but the person didn't apply it they ever bought something i think we all have and we didn't apply it we didn't use it properly we didn't use it at all but then we're mad because you know we felt like well that person brought me in and i wind up not using it what if the fluency hurts you I think, I think that when you're fluent, you address that before the purchase. There you go. There you go. Okay? You address it before the purchase. Now, you're going to buy this, and it's going to tell you there are some things you have to do. That doesn't mean read the book from cover to cover and never take action. Mm -hmm. It means there are things in the book, there are things in the program, there are things in whatever you're buying, the product, that you're supposed to do and that will create the transformation that you're looking for but if you don't do those things it's not the product mm -hmm. so you address that before the purchase like as part of your your closing you let them know that you're not just selling them something to get their money mm -hmm. because you're not remember sales is not about salesy sleazy pushy slimy and I use capital letters when I call those out because they're personas that somehow make their way into selling and they don't belong there. Because remember, sales or selling is an invitation for a client to work with you, to oh, do business that. with you. So salesy, slimy, pushy, and sleazy don't belong, but rapport and connection do. Permission does, capital P, capital R, capital C. They belong in the conversation. And then the, the whole extension of service belongs too. And the service is where you address it before the purchase. The service is, again, this is what the product will do for you. Program service. This is what is in the product. But remember, you have to take some action on some of the things there or it will not work. You know, some of the objections that you may hear sometimes are, wow, that sounds like it's going to take a lot of time, and I don't know if I really have the time to invest in doing the things that are going to make the transformation. My question is, how bad do you want it? Do you really want the transformation? If you really want the transformation, that means you've got to commit to something. So you've got to ask yourself, is this something I'm willing to commit to? I can't tell you it's too much time or, you know, you need to spend a lot of time on it. That's a decision you have to make on your own. I'm not going to tell you that. But you've got to determine if you're ready to commit to the change you say you want to see. See how I'm, I'm languaging it in a way that it's not my responsibility because I created the product. Mm -hmm. It's their responsibility for not doing what I suggest that will create the transformation that the product is supposed to create for them. Mm -hmm. It's right. not on me. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I like that you share that up front versus, you know, a little bit further into it by setting that expectation. Yeah. Right. Which is great. you got to use it. If you don't use it, it's not going to work. I think about diet pills and all these different things mm -hmm. that don't always have the effects that we're looking for. Now, guys, if you are a premium member that's on, uh, please raise your hand or put something in Q&A. Let us know if you want to hop in the seat and ask Wendy your own question directly. This is the time. Come on I, now. <laughs> I do see a question from Natalie who says, where can we find the books of Wendy Y, please? <laughs> we will be happy to know that next month in October, my first book will be published. Yes. Well, we're happy right. about that. It is called Profitable Coaching Conversations, Sales Success Strategies for Coaches, Speakers, and Consultants. Oh, good. So I you'll be it. able to find out more about that next month. Oh, good. Make sure you post that in WSA in one of our feeds. We want to know. We want to support you. Um, let me see. Now, some folks had to go, but they'll look at, listen to the um, Bravo. Oh, <laughs> good. Natalie loves it. They'll listen to the replay here. Now, keynotes. We, had, we talked about that a little bit, and I know some of this works. 
keynotes, you tend to be in front of a really large audience. Mm -hmm. And usually, you know, keynoters get paid, so they don't really have to sell. They usually do a fee, um, say whatever they're going to say, and then usually the meeting planner will mention, hey, Wendy's going to be outside signing her books, blah, blah, blah. What's your advice? In that situation, should you even apply it at all? If, if I mean, I guess it's two different questions. It's more, even if you don't have to sell, you know, there's no back of the room or anything happening, do you still suggest that you use the language of selling? If so, why or why not? I think you're always in selling mode. Let me say that. Even if you're not selling a product, you're still selling yourself to the audience. Mm -hmm. okay? And, you know, it may not be a specific program or a specific product. You're still saying, I'm looking to connect with you and there are opportunities beyond me standing before you today where we can connect. And so your, your dialogue, your conversation is still selling. It's still rapport and connection. It's still listening and focus. It's still permission. It's still authenticity. It's still service. It's still all of those elements that are part of what you share from the stage. Like you may not send them to, um, oh, you know, in my book I did this, or in this program my clients experienced that. You may not see it in that same way, mm -hmm. but you're still selling yourself because of how you are caring for the audience. Does that make sense? No, it makes perfect sense. And then two, you are selling other engagements. I mean, one, Great keynote can give you tons of spinoff business. So That's just right. like selling. So so then, Wendy, we have to put in language the next keynote. Right. Ah, so this is not just products. You're right. just selling, hey, I remember when I spoke in Japan. Hey, I remember when I spoke to a group of women. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I'm delivering a message, a keynote in a month, and we're going to be talking more about this. And, you know, it's, it's a private function, but it's, a, it's one of my signature talks, and I love sharing it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's how you see that. Ah, I love it. Do you guys hear it? See, she's, ah, she's delivering it. I love it. I love it. I love it. All right, let's see. Um, any more questions here? Because I have more, but, oh, here it is, Kristen. I'm trying to get Kristen in the chair. You want to get in the chair, Kristen? Uh, but here's her question in the meantime. She may have another one. She's asking you, Wendy, what is the hardest lesson you have learned in selling or speaking? Um, it's not about me. It's about my audience. Because I, I tell you, when I first started, even today, I'm one of those people that I get real breathy when I'm in front of an audience speaking. Again, even in this platform, I was a little breathy when we first started. So for me, the hardest lesson is it's not about my performance. It's about who I'm speaking to. It's about the audience. It's about what's in it for them. And the more I think about what's in it for them, the less I am breathy. You know what I mean? My confidence doesn't isn't an issue because I'm feeding them. I'm serving them. I'm really supporting them. And so the selling is very natural and my confidence soars. The, you know what I mean? It, it's, oh, gosh. All of a sudden, I'm not nervous. I'm not, you know, it, it goes away because it's not about my performance. Yeah. It's about I'm thinking about you. You're not a like, is my hair okay? Is my voice okay? But you just make it about them. I love it. Mm -hmm. And it, it answers a zillion questions because you just gave the definition to not being fearful. Yeah. Because it's not about you. It trickles down into your body. Yeah. It's not about you. It's so oh. not about you. Oh, yeah, good. Thank Dad. You, Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Tracy. I see your comments coming through. Yeah, because, you know, when you're speaking, no matter the platform, it's never about you. Mm -hmm. That's right. Earlier today, I will, I will tell this quick story of transparency. Earlier today, I was frantic. I've had one of those days where if something was supposed to go wrong, it went wrong. And a number of things, I've got a one-day event tomorrow, and a number of things didn't go well today. And every, everything that I teach and coach about is about being in gratitude even when things don't go right. And so I found myself really pulling on that and drawing from that and saying, I'm grateful for this. Thank you for this. And thank you for that. And even though this didn't go right, great. Thank you. Thank you. And I shared with a colleague right before I jumped on this call, maybe about 45 minutes before I jumped on, on this session, 
that I had not actually prepared a whole lot for coming on today. And she said, it's in you. It's in you. You don't really have to prepare. And it's funny because I have a page of, of notes that about 20 minutes before I sat down and made notes of things I wanted to be sure we talked about. And I have touched on them. Sorry, my computer is doing something on its own. I've touched on those things and we've talked about them, but it hasn't been my focus. It's in me. So I've just been present mm -hmm. because it's all about the service. It's not about me. It's not about whatever happened throughout my day to day. It's really about what I could do to provide service to the people who came here to hear this topic. You just said some great points. You said that you were present, you were in it, you didn't make it all about, oh my gosh, I gotta have the right comments. Chanel Callen just said, I had a breakout session when all technology failed. We've all been there. I got the best remarks and reviews from the audience. They love the message. Um, and we're impressed that I stayed calm under pressure. <laughs> and Natalie said, this is superb. It is in me. Be mm -hmm. present. That is absolutely the biggest It's in you. <laughs> it's in you. You know your stuff. You don't have to have a page of notes to, to be who you are. and to Because I'm going to tell you, much of what you've asked me was what I know mm -hmm. and also what I wrote down. Like it didn't have to be written down because I know it. My, my colleague was right. It's in me. That's right. Oh. And it's about the audience, not about me. Mm -hmm. It's All not right. about me. Deb asks, what strategies do you use to get centered after a day, after a day like that? Because you are presenting so calmly and confidently. Um, I do some breathing, like about 10 minutes before I started to do a little bit of breathing and standing in that gratitude really made a difference for me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just being thankful no matter what's going on. I'm a big gratitude person because gratitude has a way of shaking fear. It has a way of, you know, shedding the anxiety. It has a way of just sort of getting you in the right zone to serve. I'm grateful for the opportunity. I'm really glad for whoever comes on this call. I'm really grateful that Marquesa is here and, you know, she's going to be interviewing me and asking me questions. And she's really going to be supporting me through this because we're both together. We partner, partner to support the audience. So looking at it in a way that it's an opportunity. Every time I speak, no matter what it is, it's an opportunity that I'm grateful for. So recognizing that gratitude and doing some breathing and remembering it's not about me, it's about the audience, the listeners, the watchers, and I, it's in me. Like I know my stuff, so it's okay. Oh, this is, this is why I love Wendy Y. She is one of our most supportive WSA members. I love it. Now, Wendy, I want you to share with everyone, how can they reach out, get in touch with you, connect with you, and then after you do that part, I'm gonna have you Give us your advice and go wherever you want related to that. Okay. okay. Um, the best place to find me, uh, first of all, I'm across all social media platforms except Pinterest. It's not one I bought into. I'm not sure why, but I haven't. And you can find me at Wendy Y. Bailey. There's a, an, an extra Y, Wendy Y. Bailey. Uh, across all social media platforms. So that's one place. And then you can go to my website at businessbeyondlimits.com. That's businessbeyondlimits.com. Businessbeyondlimits.com. Yeah. So you, you said you want me to go anywhere I want to go? Yes, go for it. The thing about selling that most people, we talked about it a little bit, but I want to drive it home a little bit more. Most people who are speakers, who, who, cross multiple platforms that we've been talking about throughout this whole conversation, think about selling is, it's something that you do. And I want you to understand selling is part of who you are. You know, again, you, you step on the stage, you step, join a call, you join a webinar, you step into the telesummit, recorded earlier or live, whatever the case is. And selling is who you are. It's not unique. It's not different than you. So however you show up in a conversation when you're providing service to the audience and to the listeners and to the watchers, 
that's what selling really is. And the more you do that, and the more you kind of see the conversation and you share your expertise, knowing that you're sharing it in service to your audience, to your watchers, to your listeners, the more selling really is an extension of you and an extension of your service to those people. And you know what? Lisa Nichols, who we both know, mm -hmm. uh, dear friend of mine, says, you know what? It is your it is your responsibility that if you're going to drop golden nuggets and give folks information and doing your presentations, how dare you leave without saying, how can I help you further? And yeah. so I can just imagine Wendy up there sharing her information. And then she says, all right, bye, y'all. <laughs> and you're done. And they're like, oh, what, what, what? you just told me this. But I, I need to take you home with me. So how do you feel about that? That'll be kind of our closing thing there. But how do you feel about, you know, you don't have the right not to offer people more or a way to work with you? Yeah, I kind of put it this way. I totally agree with what Lisa said. And, and my language is a little different. I think that whenever you are speaking or coaching or uh, training or you are, you know, consulting someone, you're in what I call this transformation space. And that means you have a bold assignment that's related to service, a bold assignment. And here's what I mean. Every client out there that you potentially work with is there because they've got an issue, they've got a problem. And they want a solution for that problem, right? But they can only get that solution from you. They can only get that solution. They can only get that solution from you. So when you think of the mission, the responsibility you have to solve their problem, to give them a solution, it has it makes your, your work significant. It makes your work more meaningful. It makes the transformation space we're in matter to the clients. And you can't just shirk your responsibility to the clients, to the audience, to the watchers, to the listeners, because of whatever's going on in your own head about your performance. You've got a responsibility to make sure you're really like dogged in your determination and your mission to serve them, to solve their problem. And that includes extending programs and offers and opportunities to work with you beyond whatever the message is. Oh, I love it. That's why they call you a force of nature. Again, if you want to reach Wendy, you want to get in touch with her, you want to work with her, her website is businessbeyondlimits.com. She's always in our forum at Women's Speakers Association. This is a Premier member. So if you're watching this and you're not a Premier member, what's wrong? If you want to play with you know, the folks that are making things happen out there in this world, then you must join Women's Speakers Association and become a premier member. Okay. Right. Do you Absolutely. Like Life changing for me. Cause I wouldn't be here if I hadn't become a premier member. So I'm glad that I did that. See, you just deal. heard it. It's a big deal. <laughs> and I've known Wendy through the years, but we really got more familiar with each other in the WSA world. And I remember showing up, she would show up for everything. So I love this. All right, guys, we're at the end of the hour. Any final comments or words? Everyone is loving you, Wendy. Natalie says, awesome session. Mahalo, Wendy Y, and all awesome, awesome. You know, wonderful women. Uh, Deb says, wonderful conversation requesting Wendy. Uh, Chanel says, that statement about the bold assignment needs to be on a coffee mug. All right, Wendy, do it. Do it. Uh, and then Kristen says, thank you so much for your time and energy. And I want to personally thank you. You killed it. You gave from your heart. And you gave from what you know. And um, I appreciate you. You have a wonderful rest of the week. Everyone that's listening, this is Speaker Success TV, the premier member spotlight show with your host, Marquesa Petway. Guys, every week we have some awesome show that's going to deliver some type of transformation. <laughs> Next week, which is the fourth week, will be um, our networking session. That way you can get in the chair and tell the members who you are, what you do, um, and how, how you can connect with them. And then the following week, we tend to have something. We're highlighting an author because, you know, we have our own uh, publishing a leg of WSA, and then also there's the next show, Women of Influence Show. Then we're back around to uh, <laughs> we're back around to my world. 
which is a premier member spotlight. So you just may be that next premier member that we put here and you can just share your brilliance just like Wendy Y did. Thanks for sharing that story. I always wonder why you're a Wendy Y. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity, Marquesa. Thank you, my dear. All right, bye guys. Till next time, see you later. Thank <laughs> you.